Thank you very much to the Strand for having us here today. Thank you very much to the Nobrow folks for also having us here. Uh, I'm George. This is Luke. Hi. <laughs> and I figured, uh, uh, as my first question, I was going to ask you if you could kind of explain the series name, the series pun, The Hilda Folk. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so the, the, the first book that I did was called Hilda Folk, which has now been... <clears throat> It's been renamed to Hilda and the Troll to kind of get it in line with all the books being called Hilda and something. But, now I, but the series, I think, broadly is called Hilda Folk. Um, and that comes from the Iceland, like an Icelandic term for um, the, like basically the elves and other um, hidden creatures um, of Icelandic folklore specifically. I think it means hidden folk. Yeah, I think uh, well, they're called Holdu folk. Holdu folk. Uh, yeah. Um, so that's kind of where why Hilda has that name, um, kind of to make that pun. And there's definitely, um, <coughs> reading the series, there's definitely, uh, you, you take a lot of cues from um, Icelandic uh, folklore. I was yeah. curious, why Icelandic? Was this just something you were interested well, in? Well, it's not specific, it's not specifically Icelandic. It's, it's Scandinavian broadly, I think. Um, and I've kind of brought in influences from a few other folklore, um, few other cultures of folklore. Like there's, a, there's a little bit of British stuff in there, and there's um, there's a few other bits. Um, like there's, and there's like references to other things. There's some reference to like Native American folklore, um, but it originally comes from like I've, I've always kind of liked that stuff um, as a kid. My granddad. My granddad's a kind of. He's an amateur historian, and he he's kind of an expert on the Vikings. Um, so I've kind of picked up an interest in in the Norse stuff from there um, at an early age. Um, I've always kind of liked stories about trolls and stuff, but specifically, it came. It kind of started like the process of this book started while I was at university. Like we we had a. Um, a map project that we had to do and and i did i did a map of iceland where i i, I plotted out um the locations of um icelandic folk folk tales specifically um so that's when i kind of started to kind of read a bit more deeply um and kind of pick up on these little stories and that's where i read more about the elves and things and that on all that kind of stuff eventually informed a lot of the um, mythology of these comics. That segues <coughs> nicely into a question I wanted to ask you which was kind of um, looks like we have a, a very interesting crowd out here. Would You guys probably want to hear about this like sort of the idea of like your process. What informs writing your story? Um, you talked a little bit about the influences of the like the story, like the folklore that fit into this. But as far as when you sit down to create a Hilda tale, what comes to you first? Is it something I read an interview how Hilda was born out of your sketchbooks? Yeah. Is she just a series of doodles that have just come to mean something bigger to you? Do you have a plot in mind? Is there a specific story that you seek to adapt? Um, I'm not adapting any specific stories. Like I've never, I have, I have kind of thought that maybe one route to go down would be to pick a story I like and adapt it with Hilda as the protagonist. Um, but I've never actually done that. Um, and yeah, it's true that Hilda kind of came from my sketchbook. Um, as, as far as how she looks, anyway, she like I keep sketchbooks, um, and mostly they're just filled with random doodlings and sketches and. There isn't. She, she was just something, or this character was something that started to appear um, regularly. Um, I didn't really know what to do with her, and it was. I, I kind of, I kind of plucked her out of my sketchbook as, as as a kind of lead character for this thing. Like I had, I had a few, s had a, I had a, like a vibe of a story that I wanted to tell, and I knew I wanted to explore these themes. Um, and I kind of plucked her as the protagonist to to use for that, but she kind of grew separately without a real like a reason in mind. She's one of those um, characters that you discovered rather than purposely created. Yeah, I think so. Can um, you find any particular inspiration in her or for her? Um, well, like visually, she started off looking like um, 
like a character from the Moomins. Um, I think to some extent in the first book and before that I was actually like she went through a few um, there was a few versions of her I think one one version she she looked like she was from a Zelda game or something and the very first version she kind of looks like Noddy and she, um, so I don't know maybe, maybe they're there in her family tree um, I'm glad you went that direction because that's actually something I want to talk about. Uh, so yeah, I definitely saw the Tova Janssen influence in your work. Yeah, there's a little bit. I can see some Chris Ware in the way that like pages are structured, not so much in the drawing style, but in like there's just sort of the way the panels fit together. Yeah. But one of the things that's really struck me about your work is the way you kind of uh, you arrived on the scene with a really well realized and fully rec like fully realized artistic style already, and to my eyes at least as an American, very unique. Um, I can't cite, I can't look at it and see like really where it came from. And I feel like a lot of like what No Brow has published has been that way where it's just, for years I associated the English comic scene with like 2000 AD and you know, not much else. And then this, all this stuff came out, which there's a certain, it's a certain quality that there's, it seems like there's a real movement under what, underway there. I was just curious if you could say some of the influences that you had that you think you have informed you artistically. Um... Well, yeah, I mean, I guess Chris Ware is, is, an, is, is an influence. It definitely, like, I don't think of him as an influence on Hilda at all, but I, just generally the way I put together comics, I feel, has kind of come from there to a certain extent. Um, I don't know, I feel like just American alternative comics in general kind of have informed me a lot to, to start with. Um, and, yeah, I don't, I don't know specifically. Sometimes it's hard when somebody asks you to point out the specific. Yeah, well, it's like this, it's just loads of stuff. Um, so obviously Hilda is playing off some European traditions as well. Like, it's... Like yeah, I think you can make a comparison to like I'm sort of referencing Tintin with the the covers of it, yeah, um, and that kind of thing. And like Asterix were kind of some of my earliest comics memories, um, and the way it's kind of drawn, like it's kind of in a lean Claire style in a way, or um, it's a much more expressive line though. Yeah, it, yeah, it is, um, but it's still kind of. I don't know, like a lot of flat color, and um, I sort of feel like I'm sort of thinking about those things when I'm when I'm laying out the pages, even though I feel like my instincts kind of come from a more like indie comic sensibility. But I don't, I don't think about it. But I feel like that's what comes through. Like when you say that some of the panel layouts look like they could be influenced by Chris Ware. Like, I'm not, it's not a conscious thought. Like, I'm actually thinking, like, a few times, like, I've based layouts on, um, like, self-consciously on, like, Asterix pages, um, where I've tried to keep, like, a four, like, a four, um, <coughs> like, a four-tier grid. Um, but it's when I kind of stop thinking about that and I start to more naturally mess around with the panels that it, um, I don't know. That's that feels like that's just my instinct. It makes it's like the yeah, it makes sense. So that that kind of brings around to some like your color sense is extraordinary. Uh, one of the things okay. I think it's in the bird print. There's a really great juxtaposition between the scenes where we're left to home alone with Hilda's mom, where it's this very sort of auburn, very autumny colors, very warm, and then whenever we're set with the scenes with Hilda and she, when she's separating the town, it's like this a very cool sort of blue palette and then you look at these pages without even registering what the images are you're able to kind of see a lot about the balance of the story just by the way these colors are put out i wanted to talk about like if like what influences your color sense and i also wanted to just as an artist myself and i think a lot of people in the audience are probably artists as well a little bit about some of the uh the technical ways that you do your artwork mm -hmm. um so and also I'm going to throw a lot of questions at you here at once. Um, when you're writing your story, right? Like, I know, for me, when I do my books, I can't write them first, and I can't draw them first. I have to take them step by step by step by step up together in this, like, you know, 5,000 passes way of doing a story. And I was just curious, as, like, when you're writing Hilda, do you write a full script? Do you just start drawing and things come out? Do you draw everything <laughs> first and then script it after the fact? 
Um, I probably start by just drawing stuff. Um, the first couple of books was more of a process of I just had an idea in mind and I think I kind of immediately started sort of plotting pages out and kind of figured it out on the go. Like recently I've been not writing a script because I feel like the idea of writing a script if you're going to be drawing the whole thing yourself is kind of a pointless exercise because you need to, you, you're going to be changing it anyway. Yeah. So I, I can't, what I have started doing is just writing like a full a full pass of the story just in a word like in a text document um from st and try to get it as locked in as possible just in text form like it's, and then it's kind of not adapt it. yeah and when it and it ends up at, like i'm never a, that that document is not what ends up on the page but it, I, I, found, I found that it helps to um just get it down and not like a like I feel like the first couple of books were really dictated by my abilities as an artist. Um, like b before I started doing any of them, like I had this idea of, of the world she existed in and she actually would exist. Uh, I wanted her to exist in this kind of an urban environment. Like a, the, one of the earliest drawings I did of her, she was in, she was in front of a town, in front of a city, and it's obviously surrounded by countryside, mountains, and things. Um, but I imagined her in this town. But the reason I kind of s set her off in the wilderness, which actually worked out to its um, benefit, I think, because it's a nice, it's a very simple way of starting the, uh, it's like introducing the world. Um, but the, the reason I did that was because I didn't feel, like I couldn't really draw buildings very well. Or I, I definitely couldn't handle, like, I still can't really handle, like, three-point perspective or, like, I'm, I'm kind of winging it all the time. Um, so it just it just worked out a lot easier to you know to, you just throw some mountains in the background and draw some trees like I was comfortable drawing that and it was within my ability and it just so happens that it worked like that's a nice way to start the story but that's why she eventually moved um, to the city because that's kind of where like I, I feel like initially when that happens in the books it's possibly annoying for the reader. Um, Actually, I have to say it's one of my favorite bits. Um, for those of you guys who've read the stories, at the end of the second book, uh, Hilda's and her mother's house is destroyed by the giant accidentally. Spoilers. And then, <laughs> yeah, I just totally ruined the book. <laughs> this book's been out for years. Spoiler zone's dead. Um, but the, when the third book opens, there's that great little moment. I remember reading it the first time, being like, "Oh, wait, I guess that didn't count. It wasn't the canon, I suppose." Because she starts off, she's back in the wilderness. A two little intro of just her world is the way it was, and then cut all of a sudden you're, she's in the city and it's very different and it's it's a great melancholy moment and your books are full of those little moments like that where there's just these little touches that I think really it, it really makes them stand apart from a lot of what else is being made and like that little opening I'm like that made me love the series that much more just like oh my gosh she had this idyllic existence in this kind of like you know half fairyland and then all of a sudden she's in Trollberg which is still a pretty awesome place as we discover but then, you know, then we get to meet the intro the difference between her and the other kids, which mm -hmm. is another one of my favorite features in the story. I just hijacked that. I apologize. It's okay. But um, <coughs> I did want to actually ask. Um, ostensibly, these books are being written for a younger audience, although they certainly have found an adult audience as well. And it's I think it's unusual for a lot of creators to actually go after the younger audience. What what inspired you to do that? Um. It wasn't even really so much that I, I wanted to like go after that audience particularly. It was more that I wanted to, I wanted to, ex like I had, I had this, I wanted to explore this stuff, like these, these tales and these creatures and things. And it's just, it, it's kind of the natural audience for that stuff is children, I think. Um, like I, I'm, I was genuinely, genuinely interested in it as an adult, so I felt confident that adults would be into it on some level it seems you to know work out. um but there's nothing there's no re there's nothing about that that would um preclude a ch a, ch a, ch a, ch a child audience so um it well, just kind of made sense you know um but i know, I know I, i've never wanted to be a children's author um and i'm almost kind of constantly hesitant 
or kind of like reluctant to be that, which I think, uh, which I thought possibly has been to my benefit in that this is some there's some comics that are some children's comics that are really written for children directly, and but I'm, I'm never really. I'm never thinking too hard about that, and I just kind of, I, 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 I mean, I just, yeah, I found that if I just make it, you know, suitable for children and keep keep things simple, and my artwork is kind of, you know, I draw in a cartoony, colourful way, which which is naturally lends itself to um, stuff that you know kids like that. Um, it's just kind of the way it just it sort of works out that way. I think your work truly is all ages, which there are people out there who say there's no such thing as all ages comics. But I think like one of the things that makes these, this series so successful is, um, and we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, uh, like on one level you have like the protagonist is Hilda and she's this great character. Like, but then there's also, there's always a thread going on with the mother. And I, I wanted to ask you, I'll ask you now, who do you relate to more, Hilda or her mom? Well, I guess I, I, I relate to her mom. Um, like, as much as, like, she's she's not me, but she's definitely, there's some similarities there. And, like, I don't, I don't relate to Hilda, really. Like, I understand her, obviously, and I find her appealing as a person, and she's kind of who I would... I'd like to be like her, and I wish I was like her when I was a kid, but I wasn't, and, um... Yeah. I, d I definitely... Yeah, I relate to her mom, and I relate to her in, in the fact that I kind of feel protective of Hilda, you know? Like, she's... I kind of made her, so I'm kind of like her, um her parent in a way I definitely have these weird feelings like that um, her mom is such a well-rounded character and it's done in such a subtle way where like that's the sort of character that could very easily in a story be just like the worry wart staying off to the side be a wet blanket yeah but there's so many little things that you you give us little hints about the way the mom thinks and feels and there's we could read a lot into that character that you don't spell out in a way like mom is worried because this yeah, happened yeah, it's yeah. just it's in there in subtle ways well i'm really like interested in trying to um like show her as a real character and and as kind of a flawed character and someone who can be vulnerable because um, I, I feel like in in children's fiction like parents they tend to either be um, tend to either like take an antagonistic role or like a all all like a totally comforting role like it's just a source of um, someone who will make everything fine or they're absent um, you get absent and, a lot but I like the idea of just trying just even just in like little ways of showing that um you know she's a real character and she's a, she's like a real person and hopefully that the reader can understand why she does some things like even if you're kind of relate like when she like there's a couple of occasions where she kind of loses her temper with with Hilda and I feel like hopefully the the reader should be on it's kind of like you're kind of seeing it from Hilda's point of view and you you, you want Hilda to kind of get her way, really, but hopefully you can you can understand. Like like if you were a kid reading it, you would understand. You can see why why her mom's being like that. And I kind of want to. I kind of want to. Um, like in the most recent book, like she makes some like little references, like to like her childhood, and I kind of want to make it so if you were a child reading it, you can see. You don't see her as this, like other figure. Like you, you can see her as just another, like another girl, like another little girl who's just gone through a passage of time. Yeah, you know? well, she she feels like a real person. I think just like even the connections that you see, like it's never really addressed that she's uh, an artist. Hmm. It's never a, a stated plot point, but it's there right from the beginning. And it's just like she has a life that's independent. She's not just there waiting around for Hilda when she has adventures. She's doing things. And there's a lot of stuff that the two characters have in common. And you can see how 
Hilda could probably grow up into something similar to her mom, and how yeah. her mom probably came from someone pretty similar to Hilda. I think it's a real, it's a real great piece of work that you did, because as I said, very easy for the mom character to just be a prop more than an actual character, and she feels very real. Um, I also love the way you portray kids in general. In the third book is the first time we really get to meet children other than Hilda. And Hilda, I feel, feel is a really great portrayal of a kid. Like she does, she is super brave and resourceful, and she's the child we all wish we could be. But she still has her real kid moment. She's very grumpy, she can be very cranky. Maybe she, sometimes, you know, she believes things. She's like, well, you probably shouldn't assume everything's going to work out this way. But then when we see her contrast with the other kids in Scholberg, where they're just kind of like these nasty little brats who go around throwing rocks at birds and such, like, it, I think that's just another, like, I, l I really like the way you write kids. I guess I'm like, you give a very nice, unflinching portrayal of that, and that's, I don't know if there's a question there, just me <laughs> heaping praise on you, I guess. Well, I don't think, I don't think they're nasty, the, like, they're, um, like, they've picked up some bad habits, but they're, um... I think every kid goes to that monstrous phase, Yeah, right? I feel like I, mean, I know just, I did. They're just kids being kids, really. Um, just Hilda has... She's grown up with a more kind of natural respect for for the li living creatures. She has a wisdom beyond her years. Yeah. So this might be spoiler territory. But I was wondering if you could share with us anything about future plans for Hilda. Like, I've never seen any hint of how large the series would intend to be. Is it going to be four books? Are we done? Are we going to see another twelve? Like, what? How how long do you see yourself working with this character? Um, well, neither of those things. Like, I don't. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, I've, I've purposely tried to keep each book fairly self-contained. Like the the transition between her her moving from her old house to Trollberg is kind of the only um, the only like cross book transition. Like everything else, all the other, like the actual stories themselves. They don't really follow on in any particular way, and I, I try to keep it that when like a new kind of creature is introduced, um, it doesn't turn up in a major way really in the um, in the future book. Because I don't want the, I don't want the world to become too overpopulated with weird creatures. Like if each one hung around, eventually she's going to exist in this house just full of. Like spirits and elves. I do and, like um, we get to see the characters again, though. Like I like that they'll yeah, be no, trolls and they're in the come background, back. and it's just I like. I feel like it's important to keep, keep even, even though the world is like full of stuff and and it's kind of treated in an everyday way. Like to, like to the adults, it's kind of um, it's kind of boring almost. So they're not they're not really like it's all just taken as taken for granted that there are these things around. But I, I feel like it's important to keep it that at a glance, like it's. It's reminiscent of just the normal, real, real world. Um, so that when these things do happen, they still feel um, odd or like out of place. Or a little bit, but it's funny you admit there is that. I think it's in the most recent book, the Nisi. Yeah. Where, where well, like she asked somebody, like, did did your house have a Nisi? And the woman's just like, of course. Not anymore, though. It's just like there's this fantastic element. Every yeah. house has this spirit in it, but well, everybody like takes these things. They talk that, like they know about these things, but they just don't. You know, it's it just it part of everyday you life. You don't have so to see them. Like most of these creatures, they're either like they're invisible or they're hidden. Like they kind of keep to themselves. Um, like I don't want it. Like I've, re I've re like I kind of thought about it. Like are they going to be, um, like, crew like weird creatures wandering the streets? Like are they going to be sort of people living in houses that are like trolls living next door and stuff but I kind of don't I don't want it to go that way because it's going to turn into like like I don't know like like a crowd shot in Star Wars or something where every other person is a <laughs> yeah, is an alien yeah, exactly time. like I don't want it I want it to be so I like it's the balance feel. that you've struck where it's mm -hmm. like there's the weird but it's it's a little bit out of sight and it's also just kind of a little bit taken for granted. Like, I saw a giant as tall as a mountain. Oh, there's giants, but they're just not normally that tall. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. yeah the extraordinary thing is always... So it's like something extraordinary on top of something that was already weird, but for some reason, they think Yeah, yeah, it's, it's just, normal. like, they just take some of the really... And 
that actually reminds me of like one of my favorite scenes. I'm not going to remember which book it's in, where she is in the woods and she and Twig are almost stepped on by a giant. And she's like, I bet that giant knows where he's going. And we just cut to this little three-panel pa interlude of this giant. He's towering above the trees. He's looking at a map. He's like, I can't tell where I am. Everything looks the same from up here. <laughs> we never visit that character again. It's just this little side. And there, there's these funny little beats that you put in. Um, maybe that, That's not a Midnight Giant, right? That was that's in the, the first one. It's in for, okay. At Midnight Giant, there's that kind of recurring joke where like the little elves say, it's out of my hands, and I don't have hands. And they hold it up, their, their little arm stumps, and there's like, you, you linger on it for a couple of silent panels, like just to get the effect, no one's laughing at this joke. <laughs> but I'm laughing at home, because I'm like, that's hilarious. And like you do it like two or three times. It's just, it's such a great little, it's a, it's a little spin of humor that I think adds a lot to the, the way the stories are told. There's these like weird little asides that you throw in. Yeah, and, and that's the kind of thing that isn't in the first pass of the script. Like, well, I was kind of talking about that, but got distracted. But like, I'll, I'll do this first. Like, I'll be typing out the story, but none of that stuff is in there. Like, that will occur to me on the page. You know, like right before, I'm like, I think it's all ready. I think it's all wrapped up. And I'll realize, like, this is a good place for, like, a joke will occur to me, and I'll I'll put it in. And they're the kind of, and it's important to then make room for that because yeah. they're the little bits that people remember, and they're kind of what makes it good. And and if that stuff wasn't in there, it just becomes a very functional, just sort of plot point to plot point kind of boring story. I think. They must feel really good when you come up with those bits. Yeah, just that would be like those are like obviously the giants. You need like, them yes. as well. Get you, in there a second time and holding up his little stump, saying, "I don't even have hands." Ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> Nobody laughed. Can you tell us any specific future Hilda like spoilers for like a future book, or are we not even at that point for anything? Um, no, no. <sighs> <laughs> Make something up and lie. Yes. <laughs> there's a few kind of like um, there's some creatures and things I want to explore there's a kind of like there's a kind of like pond spirit that i, I want to bring into it at some point um who she'll make friends with i feel like she'll probably she may have an adventure at sea mm. at some point but there's lots of yeah i mean i got lots of ideas yeah, the books are overflowing with ideas we were talking about this also earlier there's at the end of the first book, you have, um, is it the first book? No, it's the second book. You have that little, there's like, towards the end of the book, there's just a, a spread where it's two pages of like the giants. And you have names for every giant. None of these characters, except for two of them, have appeared in the story up until this point. And you have like little synopses of each of these characters, like what they meant, what made this particular giant special. This one had a worm-shaped body. She made the other giants feel uncomfortable. This one didn't prefer the company of them. It looked for its five heads. You know, there's all these little bits. Like every one of these guys has a story written about them. And like, I don't think you'll ever return to those characters. But it's just like, it's like, it's almost like a, a two-page Bible of somebody look at this and just kind of like run crazy writing giant stories. And that, that's such a cool thing, too, the way you have these, it's, I think one of the things that makes, you were saying before about how I'm putting little jokes is what prevents it from being a very perfunctory note-to-note -note adventure story. The fact that you seem to have done an immense amount of homework, making this, the, this story so much bigger, where, like, you've thought out all these different giants. Now, they don't have a, a mythological or folkloric uh, precedent, those particular giants, do they? Um, no. No. But, um... But they are all kind of in in the vein of things that they seem as if they could be. Yeah, exactly. And I feel like that that helps. I mean, most of the stuff. There's some creatures in there that are like that I've just made up, um, like the salt lions um, and the wafts. Like they're just <laughs> stuff that um, they've felt right. You know, like I'm not I'm not trying to do. Like actually, ad I'm not actually adapting folklore, but obviously most of this stuff comes from a lot. A lot of this stuff comes from real um, stories, and the fact that people are kind of already sort of vaguely familiar with those, I kind of think helps. Is like doing a lot of the legwork for me. Like you kind of already know what you're getting into with with giants and trolls, and if I just kind of like throw a name out there and a picture of this thing, you can already start to imagine what like what kind of stories this this giant might might have, you know? Yeah, I like the wafts, that was funny.
Um, let's go back to a little bit of the technical stuff. If you're actually creating a page, can you guide us through the steps? Um, yeah, I guess I will. Um, I think I'll thumbnail it to start with. Um, I'll usually. I'll have. I usually have like a page count that I'm either locked in or that I'm aiming for. Um, and I will have already have planned the story roughly, and I'll try and like break it up into what I imagine um, into like pages, like how what I imagine how how I imagine each bit, how many pages it will probably need. Which is often way off, but I'll kind of just write little numbers, like I'll need four pages for this camping scene, I think, um, or this bit. I can maybe do in one, like if it's just a very like one note thing, and, I'll th and maybe that's um, and maybe I'll make a note that that's like an underestimate, um, and then possibly um, I'll overestimate another bit so that if 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 I think it probably won't need that much, um, won't need as many pages as I think, then I can go back and like add a page to this other bit that I'd kind of I think possibly needs more something like that like it's all it's complicated and are you super kind of duper locked work. in too for the page counts um, i've never actually counted your pages no they're diff they're um two of them midnight giant and bird prey to 40 pages but the most recent one's like 60 65 okay. i think um well it's generally like lock like i can't just decide it's going to be twice as long you know so after your thumbnail, which for me that's always the hardest process. It is the hardest part. Like once it's the, like a nightmare. I mean, once the, the thumbnail is kind of the work. Yeah. Um, like once I figured out. Um, yeah, that's when you how, how how I figure out if if it all fits into the the book and stuff. And my, and my thumbnails generally end up reflecting what's in the book like the panels will be r roughly the same like I'll jig have to jiggle things around and there'll be a couple of occasions where a couple of pages will um, have to kind of shift or get lost but usually I try to like to keep things simple I try to keep it so that scenes end on a page turn because it's when like stuff is like crossing two pages that's when it gets like super complicated and you can't yeah. really shift stuff around very easily but it's easy enough to kind of add another row of panels to something, which I do often, I end up with like way too many panels on a page. They're like way more than I would like really, um, a lot of the time. Um, and how long does that whole process take you? Like when you're thumbnailing out a book, say like the most recent one, 65 pages, like how long does it take you to, because the thumbnails where you said the work's being put in, that's you really writing it. Where does that, like how long does that whole process take? Um, it's hard to say. Um, if I'm working on it, like I'd, if I'm working on it intensely, like a few weeks maybe. Oh my god, um, really? But like so quick. <laughs> but, but well, like with this last book, I kind of worked on it for probably about four months for the for like the main work of it. But I was kind of planning it and writing it, and like a lot of like it felt like I was working on it for for a whole year which I kind of you know I basically was um, like counting like the sketches the warm up and all yeah, that yeah because it's just there's a lot of thinking that needs to be done um, yeah and it's, there's a lot of stuff that is kind of intangible that you need to do before or at least I need to do before I can get to the stage where I can um, like write that document out and so, so after you have everything settled out, where it's in, like it's been thumbnailed out, you have the story worked out, all the beats, to do the actual finished artwork, um, do you use pencils, pen and ink, Cintiq? Um, I do. I, I I pencil it on. Um, yes, yeah, just pretty straightforward. I, I I pencil it and then ink on. It's been a bit different each time. I, the, the last one I inked on top of my pencils, um, with a uh, brush, brush and ink. Um, but prior to that, I'd always use like a Pentel brush pen, and like I inked like I'd, I've tried a different thing each time. Like for Bird Parade, I think I inked on top of like I printed blue lines out from a pencil sketch and inked on top of those. So you're always changing up the, the yeah. Well, it's I'm never 
it's always hard and I'm, all, I'm never like satisfied that this is a very good process like it I, always feels like I'm each like, book has a distinctive look like you could definitely yeah. see there's changes going on artistically in each one and I like that there's definitely been series I've followed where you kind of see at some point the artist gets off the tracks from what at least what I personally like. You're mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, I kind of wish they brought back a little what they used to do. But everything that you've done, it's it's different each time, but it still feels exactly like what you've established in the series. And it still looks, it looks great. And But it's, it's nice to see that you grow. Like, it's in, in the third book, you started bringing in, like, more close-ups and such. It's like you were just expanding, like, the, the sort of yeah. scope of how you were telling the story. And it was, like, it was really cool. It was, like, if the first couple of pages that happened, I'm like, oh, it's different. But it, it looked great. It was a great, it was a welcome addition to the, you know, the, the, the category of stuff that you could use. It was just really interesting to see how each book you do grow. It seems to be a conscious effort to do it. Yeah, I think so. Um, <clears throat> it's kind of unconscious as well, though, because I, um, like I design kind of shifts from book to book a little bit um, and in, 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 a, in ways that are were like, in hindsight, are way bigger than they felt at the time. Um, like, I would, like from the first book to the second book, I, I knew I was kind of redesigning her a little bit, but she kind of looks totally different, and she looks like she's a different age or something. Um, well, I, I know I'm always kind of worried about that, but I seem to have gotten away with it, and like it doesn't seem like it's an issue. Maybe. Um, yeah. But she just jump around a lot. Like it's not, they're definitely not consistent. But maybe it's fine. Like well, I just try not to worry about it, and it seems that it's. I've done, it, I've done it in the way that felt best at the time. Well, a lot of it's just the natural evolution of the story. Anytime yeah. you draw a character hundreds of times like that, you're going to start simplifying certain things and expanding out other features. Um, I actually think that she's kind of come around a little bit, like she actually made more of a departure from her earlier appearances, and I feel like Hilda now looks a little bit closer to the way she did originally. Yeah, yeah, It's like yeah. she kind of like was exploring this other look for a while. I was joking before, it's like she tried freckles for a bit. Yeah. She's like, nah, I don't no, like freckles. she did, yeah. That's exactly what <laughs> She happened. loses the freckles. Yeah, and like, in, but it's like, in, I didn't, it's like I wasn't happy with the way she looked in the first book. Like I had this idea of what I wanted to look like, and, and I couldn't do it. I couldn't, she, she just looked weird to me and she still looks weird in it but I kind of like how she looks now but um, it wasn't what I wanted but it's, it's like now I can do that like the way she looks in the most recent book I probably won't feel this way in a year's time like I'll <coughs> probably feel like I need to change her again in a, li in a little way in a, in a way but I, now I feel like the way I'm drawing her now is how I wanted to draw her initially but I hadn't figured out how yet um, which is why I think she changes so much in Midnight Giant because I felt like, well, she's wrong. Um, I'm going to so try take something else a different out. degree, yeah. Um, yeah. But then I realized that, and then, it, then she changed, kind of changed back again. So she looks a bit more like, if that's the one, Midnight Giant is where she really has a kind of different look. It kind of looks like that. Was, that's the first book in a way. Yeah, I can see it because it's the furthest yeah. a far a field from what she ends up looking like. We are, are running a, just a little bit low on time, so I did oh, sure. want to leave space for a couple audience questions before we actually wrap up, because I'm sure you guys could talk about this for ages. But does anybody else have a question this evening that they'd like to ask Luke? I'm going to bring you a microphone, okay? Um, yeah, I'm just actually wondering how you apply color to, um, and like how you think about color um, as well. Like. Um like when I'm thinking about it or like technically how I do it. Like so yeah, the process. Well I do it in I just colour it in Photoshop, like it's pretty just like the normal way. Like I used to I'm kind of like just magic wanding it all now. Like I used to kind of just colour between the la well I'll just colour with like a Wacom tablet. That's yeah. It's not very interesting. But that's what I do. Um Do you know the uh B Pelt plugins for Photoshop? What? Oh, get talk to me afterwards. There's this plugin you can put in where it automatically colors under the lines for you. Oh no, I don't. I do know that. I don't okay. like it. Oh, you don't? Okay. No, it's hard. It's, it doesn't work properly. Well, maybe I'm just doing it wrong. <laughs> um, yeah, as far as like thinking about color, um, I think I kind of just I try to keep the actual number of colors down like as low as possible. Like if if. Like if I'm going to use a blue in in a page, like I'll try and make sure that everything that's blue is the same blue, and I'll only change I'll only change it if it if there's two blue things that are kind of knocked up against each other and it looks weird. Um, that's kind of what I try to do. I mean, it doesn't always work out like that, but 
as a loose rule that kind of keeps you from going crazy and just having like an ugly mess and it just looks looks more considered you know and I kind of I've kind of got like a tss, like at this point I've got kind of stock color schemes that I can kind of I kind of go to like I don't really I don't like thinking that I just I'm kind of lazy like that and just always do the same thing but I've found things that work for me um and if I if I go away from that it's like I'm making a specific point to do it um, but I'm usually just sort of looking for warm like nice looking colors like it's always just a little bit red like a little kind of earthy I guess um yeah anybody else have a question out there this evening okay bring your microphone Hi. Um, what other uh, non-comic things would you say uh, influence you? Um, I don't know. <laughs> Everything. This. Um, I don't know. Just film, animation, <laughs> books. <laughs> I don't know about like. I, I, I don't know about that. Uh, I don't have any specific things. I'm always like drawing on, you know, like obviously for this thing, it's all like, like there's some specific like books on folklore that I've kind of gone back to a few times. Like, is this old? There's, um, there's a really old book that's literally just called Scandinavian folklore. It's from like the 1890s or something, and it's like direct. It's like directly recorded, like it's this guy who went round and like recorded oral stories, um, and they're written down in a really s strange, matter-of-fact way that has kind of like kind of influences these comics or initially how I started to tell them initially. Um, yeah, are the films of Miyazaki an influence of yours? I feel like there's a similar sensibility. Yeah. Yeah, they are, I guess. Um, there's a kind of... There's a certain sort of tone to them that I like, that I try to kind of get in these co in these comics. Um, like, I don't know, a quietness, which is hard to do, you know, comics are quiet yeah. anyway. Um, but I'm kind of like... I'm kind of like pacing it in a specific way in my head um, and I kind of think about those films in that regard um, just kind of the way the characters speak I feel like influences the way I will write characters even though I've, I've realised that when you're reading a comic I feel like people are reading it in, in a much more rushed way than I'm probably thinking about it I actually had a question for you. I saw looking at your website recently that you had the opportunity to storyboard for Adventure Time, which is yeah. one of my favorite comics. Can you talk about how that process, or one of my favorite cartoons rather, can you talk about how you got involved with that or what the process was like working with that team? Um, well, they kind of generally, um, Adventure Time's kind of made a thing of hiring cartoonists, which is kind of, um, it's just kind of cool and it's kind of becoming a trend across because, because Adventure Time's been such a big a big hit like it's like at least a cartoon network and I think further afield now they're kind of following suit um, and that's kind of informing the kind of the feeling and the tone of those comics and the uh, cartoons and the look and the look of them um, just kind of breaking away from more traditional like to what like the kind of previous era of um <coughs> like powerpuff girls the dexter's lab like i mean the, the, there was a certain look at some point um in the 90s which um yeah well, it's different now but anyway it's um it's cool uh, you, you get to i got to um they have very. They don't really. They don't write scripts for the the shows. They write very vague outlines, and then they hand it over to. They've got like a core team of storyboard artists. But I just did like they they get um, they get people to do like fill in episodes. Which is basically what I did. Um, 
you kind of got to come up with with everything really like you have an outline of what has to happen in the show but um, there's no real dialogue you have to come up with that you have to come up with um, pretty much everything that happens on screen and yeah that's it's cool it's very much your episode then yeah it's, it's, it's really it's exciting it's, um, it was really cool to do um, yeah well, you have one more back here <laughs> <laughs> I did well I've done two I didn't do the whole episode. Like each episode split between two, two people. Um, I did an episode called Candy Streets, where like Finn and Jake, I just can't like they're turning into the cop stuff. Um, and I did an episode called Frost and Fire, where um, it's like Finn, like like it's, he makes Flame Princess and Ice King just have a lot of fights. Uh, <laughs> Which is cool. So I, I did all like the fight scenes in that, which is awesome. Totally awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's about all the time that we have for this evening. Thank you so much, Luke and George, for joining us. Thank you all for being here this evening, too. We do still have lots of copies of Hilda available at the back of the room, and uh, he's going to stick around and sign some for us after. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.